Most importantly, I want to thank Wilson Sincini, Good Richard Casey McGlynn, and of course, David Kasich uh, from MedTech Strategies for their support for this event tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you. Josh. Well, it's rare that we have a celebrity here. And Kavita, <laughs> Kavita has joined us as well. So that makes tonight <laughs> doubly special. <laughs> No, I mean, I think I think it's safe to say that in many ways you're the face of our COVID response in this country. <laughs> we'll we'll talk a little bit. Well, I'm I'm from the East Coast. I I think we've done a good job, relatively. Of course, I'm from New Jersey. What do I know? Um, so let's just jump right in. You're from Texas. I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what was your early schooling and career life were you always going to be a doctor what 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 part of texas were you from Santa. 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 and were you always good were you, did you always have uh, medicine no no i was a liberal arts major double majored in philosophy and math and was kind of the, i was the oldest of three girls what which was so I didn't do, I didn't really get turned into kind of onto medicine until after I had spent some time internationally after my undergrad um, in India and working actually kind of now the Kashmiri region, which has had a lot of political tensions. And at the time, because of even further political tensions between Pakistan and India, very little access to menstrual education, something that's still a problem in much of the globe. You know, girls who didn't understand like what their periods were, no access to pads or tampons. So part of my job was to actually teach young girls. I could speak some of the dialects and some of the languages. And then I was like, how come I actually would kind of go back to mentors in Texas. And I said, why, like, why are we not doing this? Why are we not solving this problem? And they would, some of my mentors would say, because all the men are doctors, our doctors are men. And so that was when the, I'm very old, the medical schools were not 50, 50 men and women. It was still a majority the medical school graduates were men. And so I kind of said, well, maybe I could do this medicine thing. I had taken the LSAT so I could have been a lawyer. And I my, thought that was my destiny because I talk a lot. But, you know, decided that medicine was kind of a safe profession because I could get employed anywhere, but lawyers don't always get employed. So, so what's yeah. Your oh, yeah. So I have a, yes, you wanted... Yeah, since right. Well, yes. So I, I th third time's a charm. So I, I'm the only person you're going to meet that had like a, basically a full ride to Stanford undergrad and turned it down, and thought, yeah, exactly, right. It's like Where did you go? UT Austin. I went to a state school close to my parents. You know, having the daughter like leave the family. You know, it wasn't. And I didn't know what I was. I was the year. It was the year that somebody named Sergey and somebody named Larry came to Stanford. So I always tease my parents about that when. We talk about Google and then um, interviewed for residency as well, but didn't come here. Did you have any of your, your practice? I want to get into your work in the policy circles, but sure. you, what, was the, what was the time period between practicing medicine and, and actually getting into, into the government? And what led you to I the government? A, I did a master's in UCLA at the fellowship, it was uh, that more education. Kept on getting, just kept on studying and getting degrees. But from med school graduate, as a chief resident, from kind of the end of my training to working for Ted Kennedy, about six years, almost oh, seven. Kennedy, and was that at the that was at the end of his career, or how long did you yeah, work for him? He lived for three years after that. Yeah, so he he died about three four years later. So I worked for him the tail end of the Bush administration. And, and what, what drew you to policy? So I, I don't think I ever was somebody who said I wanted to do policy. I just always had, I have some mentors in here, Kevin Schulman, people who I always admired. And I, I would read these research papers in Health Affairs, the New England Journal, JAMA. And I would always kind of say, like, these are such smart articles and such smart people. Like, why, why, why don't we do these ideas? That You could say that was policy. But I don't think I ever thought, I, we learn kind of from who we are mentored by. So I always thought I would be a health services researcher. I would try to get a paper in the Million Journal, and then I would be important, and that I'd write for my own grant funding. 
And it turns out that I was good. It, it, the danger in medicine is that we're all high functioning people and we're kind of good at probably anything that we tackle. But I think I had to come to peace with, you know, did I really enjoy what I was doing? And I, I, I didn't. But that's not how I kind of landed in policy. <laughs> Yeah. He did. They, I think he thought I was like this Patel from Harvard. So for a long time, like there was this like running because I wasn't a Red Sox fan. I was. I all. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't like lobster rolls. I like all the things. Like, and he would just kind of like look at me and kind of wonder how I got there. But so I. Uh, true story. And this is where I think in life. I know this is about innovation. But innovation is a combination of taking risks and also knowing kind of when in time to take a risk that you could also fail at. And one of the things I did was I knew that I wasn't getting, everybody wanted me to try to publish. And I, at the time, there was blogs and a lot more kind of online is the beginning of like this time when you could do on kind of online publications. And I had done a series of studies in mental health and I kept waiting to try to get, I was getting rejections for papers and then proceeded to publish on some of the new online journals that would just kind of allow you what we would call preprint now. And one of them was around like mental health and access to mental health services and because of Google, which I could have helped found if I'd gone to Stanford. Because of Google, one of the Kennedy staff found my little paper and contacted me. I was working at the RAND Corporation. I had a dual appointment at RAND in UCLA and sent me an email and then called because I thought it was spam. I didn't understand, you know, senate.gov called me and said, well, we'd like to have you come to DC and talk about your paper and talk about your research and your findings. And I was like, get the hell out of here. Like, what is, you know, I, Ted Kennedy was an idol of mine. So Did you that see was, it as a trade-off? I mean, that, that you could either practice medicine or work in policy in DC, or did you, did you balance the two in those early no, days? Ethically, I mean, so things happened when I got a job. Uh, but because of um, and I could not practice, and I couldn't. There was nothing else but being kind of part of the staff. So you were a pure policy. I could not do any. Yeah, that was. I couldn't do anything else. So there's an interesting timing issue in that Ted Kennedy died in 2008, mm -hmm. which was the year that uh, Obama became president, mm -hmm. and you subsequently worked for Obama. Um, was Ted Kennedy interested in the same things that? you were working on for Obama and and how much it was ACA Affordable Care Act focus? What what was Ted Kennedy's big policy concerns? Well, I mean, he said his friends were regretting not passing health care decades earlier when he had the chance to, when he went up against, when he went up against Jimmy Carter. So I think he has, he could have done it during Nixon, could have done it. I mean, there were a number of times that he admits, and he's written about this publicly, his memoir covers it, his largest regret was not getting health reform done. And I think he knew that this was going to be the window to get health reform done. So was that, was that in fact, the primary focus of his office in terms of policy issues? Health reform to back the legislation was very well and they were doing issues. So, you know, it was never one thing, but yeah, health reform was probably like one of his most mental health parity, tobacco legislation, all of that kind of, um, to him was like very important to get done. Yes. So we now think about the Obama administration primary policy initiative, maybe primary policy success, depending on which side of the aisle you sit, um, as the Affordable Care Act. Were there other policy issues that uh, were percolating in yeah. Obama's office? I started in the White House and I worked on the audit department. You might ask what oh, really? somebody already know about the audit But there were, the part of the challenge of any new White House is that there's a lot of staff coming in. They need to get security clearances. People are moving from Harvard to DC because everybody works at Harvard. And so you kind of have this dynamic where you just need staff to hit the ground running. If anybody's watched the show West Wing, they kind of talk about this, like in the beginning of an administration when they turn over. And it's true. So you just have staff and you just need them to do things because the country needs to continue to run. And the end of the Bush administration, if anybody will remember, it's kind of the big three auto bailout was structured, but that had to continue. And then we had done um, a legislative package right at the end of the Bush administration called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It's actually something Joe Biden took a lot of initiative to own, to build, to kind of inject into the economy post-recession funding for highways. A lot of what we're talking about now with infrastructure. So I worked on 
um, highways in Oregon. I worked on bridges. I, I, I didn't know anything about it, but it was, it was kind of great. Like this is actually why I think policy is a, a very exciting way for innovators, research, anybody, you know, anybody who wants to kind of challenge the way they think or how people make decisions. It's a, it's a pretty great learning lab for that. So, I mean, I think anybody who lived through the Obama administration, certainly from the outside, experienced the ACA as a highly controversial uh, initiative that faced a lot of opposition. And I wonder, from your perspective on the inside, how you saw it, how close to what Obama would ideally like to have achieved was ACA, how, you know, contentious was it? I mean, I mean, I guess the, it's, I don't think it's saying too much that there's still some opposition to ACA, yeah. as we saw during the uh, early years of the Trump administration. Give us your reflections on on how the how the evolution of the ACA and and what we now have, how close that is to what Obama wanted initially, and what you guys all wanted to do. But, I mean, actually, the path to legislation was fairly close. The things we had to sacrifice. And um, political deal making 101. You know, you can't, healthcare is a zero sum game. You have to find cost savings somewhere. And so you're going to upset some set of constituencies. So you had to decide who do you want on your side? We had to have doctors on our side. We couldn't upset the doctors, the nurses. We had to think about unions. We had to think about pharma, devices, insurance industry. And so the hard part of the ACA was kind of keeping all of these constituencies in balance because if any one of them kind of left and defected, the whole thing would fall apart. Now, I would actually say the biggest challenges with the ACA were internal because as polling as 2009 went along in, in August of 2009 was um, congressional recess and members were going back to their hometowns and there were pickets and rallies, you know, keep the government out of my Medicare. I mean, these crazy kind of anti-health reform sentiments and a lot of misinformation about it, something that's a theme today. And so our biggest enemy was internal with the political dynamic because we had Rahm Emanuel, the chief of staff, David Axelrod, our political strategist, and they were like, this is polling terribly. We need to kind of move away from this. Maybe we do a smaller version of healthcare reform, children's health insurance, and some other things, and we move on because the country wants us to. And I'll give credit to Barack Obama. He is the only, it was, it was only him. He was the only per he basically said, he's like, no, we're going to do this. I don't care what, you know, I don't care what it costs. He's like, I'll talk to Pelosi. I'll do this. We're going to get this done. And sure enough, he did. Bush is um, acknowledged the description of his policy was compassionate conservatism. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly the notion of, of a, you know, government funded and government run healthcare system was not unusual. They're all over okay. Europe and Canada. Were you surprised at how divisive an issue as you talked through the launch of it? Yeah, I think there was just, you know, this is kind of, again, like a, some people look at policy and wonder, like, how does this affect what they're doing? I think for a lot of the entrepreneurs, biodesign kind of institute fellows, and you have, by the way, probably the most talented kind of groups of people I've seen. If I had had anything like this environment, and God knows what, you know, would have happened. So I, I think there's, I think there's always this kind of sentiment that, if people don't understand my ideas, then it's just, they don't understand. And part of what we saw with health reform, actually with any policy issue is that there's always divisive, there's always partisan divisiveness, but it's really having to kind of help break down why that issue is of incredible importance to that very person. So the concept for Republicans was keep the government out of our health care. ACA actually didn't inject the government into health care. If anything, I could argue it really just kind of bolstered Medicare Advantage, the private sector, and actually many liberals would argue that that didn't do much to help contain costs, and they probably they were right. However, it did. If you could have said Medicare Advantage would grow by two hundred percent because of what we did, remember Medicare used to be called Medicare Part C. It was something that was a Republican kind of darling and concept. Orrin Hatch, Mark McClellan, a number of people who were very important in shaping some of that. But that got lost, you know. So it often takes like kind of breaking things down and 
Right, National Healthcare Light. Exactly, exactly. So, so how long did you stay in the, in the Obama White House? So the, AC, the ACA passed in March of 2010, and I left after that because. Why? So I, I will talk very kind of. It's it's very easy to kind of seem like everything went really well. Um, it was very hard for me to balance. I was I was a doctor. I, was, I didn't practice, but it was very hard to kind of the power dynamics, the political dynamics. And then I was used to making deals. That was something we had to do in the Senate. But it felt like there was so much. I felt like I was also not my best self because I would have these huge days where we were trying to negotiate and balance constituencies. And I'd get on phone calls with like the AMA, hundreds of doctors at night. And it was just an incessant amount of complaining. And there was just no way I became like this kind of receptacle for people whining, people complaining. And I had to kind of acknowledge, like, I didn't like it very much. And I wasn't trying, I haven't been very purposeful about saying, you know, what is this job going to get me? Because that's just, I, I don't think that way. But everybody in the White House is looking to do something else. And I wasn't. I had no, you know, someone said to me, like, well, what do you want to do next? Do you want to go to the you know, CMS? Do you want to go to the FDA? I said, I, I want to, like, watch TV and sleep. I mean, I, there, there was, there was this, there, there was this show Glee. I, I remember being at the um, April Easter egg 2010 Easter roll and like the cast of Glee was on the stage singing and I'm like I want to like do that like you know so I got I got pretty burnt out I got pretty depressed and it was just because I wasn't I just wasn't happy and the people around me were incredible Brian Deese is now in charge of the National Economic Council I was mentored by Peter Orzag who ran the Office of Management and Budget he's at Lazard They're incredible bright people I found myself not I just I, I was just was nasty. Were you disillusioned or did you just give up this time to move on? I mean, how Probably you, both. But, when you think about but also, what was I doing? Case, you know, Do you see that as ultimately a victory or are you disappointed at what no, no, came out? No, no, no. It was a victory. We got 10 million people covered with health insurance that would not have had it. We did not anticipate the Supreme Court making a decision that would allow for states to not expand Medicaid. So when the largest states in the country Florida and Texas still to this day have not expanded Medicaid. That's a loss, but we, I mean, like you couldn't have anticipated what the Supreme Court would do. So I know it wasn't that. It was just that there was, sim I, I simply was not, I really was not, I was not happy. I was doing things that I felt like they weren't beneath me, but I, I was 30 something years old and I felt like I wasn't, I was like, what am I doing? I'm a doctor and I'm not applying what I know about, I hadn't practiced. I said, I'm not doing what I'm good at. I'm a really good doctor, and I kind of need to figure out how to get back to that. So is there anything you would have done differently? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So absolutely. I, I was always kind of, I think women do this. We take on a lot of responsibilities. We say yes. We just show up. What I didn't do, and, you know, I had read, it's not leaning in. It's not, I mean, it's all these things. It's actually just recognizing what you're, good at, but then finding a way to kind of communicate effectively, like, this is, this is what I do well. This is what I really do well. You need to use me for this. And that was just not something I mentioned. I, I started working on the auto bailout. I did all these things because we needed people to do things and I just did it. But I had to kind of think hard. I mean, I was truly, I really did burn out. I mean, Mark McClellan found me, I don't know, six months after I'd left the White House. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, why don't you come, you know, what are you doing? And I said, I just needed to figure out like what I was doing, who I was. I went to my couch. I mean, I didn't do anything. I, I literally watched Lee. I called Ed Miller, who was the Dean of um, Johns Hopkins Medicine uh, and said, you know, I had worked with him in the White House and gotten to know him. And I had been out of practice at that point for six years, almost five, six years. And I said, I, I, is there a way I said, is there a way I can practice at Hopkins? And at the time, you know, technically you were supposed to kind of train if you hadn't been out, if you had been out of practice for X number of years, you were supposed to kind of be shadowing somebody. And he just, because he's who he was, he just fast tracked me through and uh, I was practicing ambulatory internal medicine and then just, yeah. you know, at Hopkins. Yeah. Uh -huh, at Hopkins. So you weren't so disillusioned that you wanted to leave the area no i knew i knew my time with kennedy taught me that i had a skill set 
and that there was a role for helping bright people kind of think about how to make a change and what does legislation look like, how to work with agencies. I knew that that was a good, that was me. That was actually my best. And it was the listening to doctors whine on telephone calls that like did not bring out the best in me. So on a scale from here, everyone's got to be a political warrior and you get someone new, you lose some over here, the system's totally screwed up and you can't really get what you really need done. Where, where, where do you fall down as you think about policy and things? Oh, definitely. I mean, you win some, you lose some, but I actually think that's the winning in policy. I mean, I, I, I always, it's true. It's not a joke. Like great policy, you got to piss off a lot of people and you make some people happy and then, you know, you've done something well. And that means in the process you lose a little bit too. So it's, you know, policy is very ephemeral and kind of this notion, but it comes down to actually taking those victories and losses, but then understanding that that's part of like propelling things forward and uh, my legacy in policy is that I help all these people kind of understand how everything they're doing can have an impact. And that's kind of truly, you know, how I think about things now. So it's definitely on that end of the spectrum. I want to talk about your relationship with NEA and how you got there. Yeah. But in the, in the light of that yeah. comment, because you said to me, you, you don't mind controversial questions. Yeah. Sure. Um, how do you feel about the assault that has been starting with it even before the Trump administration, 17 attorneys general around the, around the country tried to declare it illegal? How, how, I mean, is that part of the give and take of political discourse or is that I can't believe that they're doing this. This is really a helpful thing and they shouldn't be screwing around with that. No, I'm not. No, I'm. I'm it not, of course, it's not helpful. I'm not surprised, was not shocked. But also, I, I just think that, and especially now, everything is just incredibly partisan. So what I did know is that a lot of it is symbolic. There's kind of this, like, you could say that on the Democratic side around reproductive rights, right? We, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, like, need to kind of come together. And some of this is symbolic. Sometimes it translates into changes in law. Sometimes it actually also catapults people into political circles. Every, all, all of these people have motivations. I think the key is understanding what their motivations are. And then you don't really, you know, one thing I've learned over the time is you don't take it personally. You know, it's not about me. It wasn't about Barack Obama. It was just, this is what they needed to do in order to kind of continue to move forward in order to have their names kind of go out there. Well, that's a discussion we could have for a long time. So sure. let's talk about innovation. Right. So we have been talking about innovation. How did you get to NEA? Policy is innovation. What can someone like you do for a group like NEA? And and how does your policy background? Knowing <laughs> <laughs> it has your policy expertise yeah. help an investor group. Yeah. So um, I know you had um, the famous back alley. Yes. Uh, so the truth is, this is how it happened. So Scott Gottlieb, I worked with Scott when he was in the Bush administration. I was working for Kennedy, so I got to know him. You um, how did you, was it you were working with him? Yeah, at it, the FDA, or you were working initially at the FDA, the and then he FDA followed FDA Mark to CMS. Is that the right? Yeah, 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 yeah. no, no, I, this FDA and CMS. Uh, and so we got to know each other very well. People think that Republicans and Democrats don't get along. It's farthest from the truth. I was actually, we carried on and had like a friendship that continued and we would just get together every now and then complain about people. And so he, uh, he always, Scott was always this like entity that I never understood, conservative, very nice hair, and he would just kind of go away. And I was, I was always like, you know, the liberal flaming Democrat, and we would talk and argue. We actually wrote op-eds and papers together, which is shocking. So then he gets nominated to, I knew he would go into the Trump administration, not as what, but I knew something would happen. He told me he was going to go in probably, you know, he was going to be nominated to be the commissioner. And he was like, I don't know if I'll get it. And I was like, of course you will. And so, you know, we talked about that, but then he said, well, listen, Kavita, you know, what, what about you taking my kind of doing a swap, so to speak, and you taking my job as a venture partner at NEA. I remember it was on a phone call and, and I said, I, I don't, what does NEA do? I don't, I don't, I don't. And he's like, Kavita, it's the largest like venture capital firm in the world. I'm like, I thought that was Kleiner Perkins or so, you know, and, 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 he, and he's like, don't tell people that. <laughs> I, 
I go, I thought that was Kleiner Perkins. And he's like, no. And then he started telling me. And I was like, huh. I said, well, what would they want with me? And he's like, you know, Kavita, I don't do that much. I just show up a couple times a month. And he's like, I, I, you know, it's really a, like, it's really a light lift. You know, they've got a DC office. And I'm like, I could get paid to like show up once a month. That sounds good. Maybe, you know, he, he knew like I had been on this government kind of primary care salary, which was really sad. And I, you know, two little children, you know, about one pregnant was like, yeah, I was pregnant um, with my second and had my first. He's like, you need to pay for your kids. And I was like, sure, I'll meet these people. I forget. I, Josh and I, I, we, I met uh, one of our other general partners in Chevy Chase. I met our other one, uh, several of Josh and his colleagues and did these interviews and then became a venture partner. When was this? So 2016? Yeah, two thousand yeah. It was right at the beginning of the Trump administration, 16, 17. So what's been your experience now that we're six years in, well, into is. this? Yeah. <laughs> I have a venture capitalist. I have, it's very interesting. So there are people here who I've known for, for a long time before. And, they, and we always talk about entrepreneurs and innovation. I have no idea of how hard it is to start something. Even how much harder it is to raise money for that something, to hire a team, to do the hard, I mean, no appreciation for how hard that was. And then also just, I had had this like very kind of bizarre notion of what investors were. They were fancy people in fancy suits and, you know, they didn't really understand science. They just kind of threw money at things. And that may be true for non-NEA. So that, that, that may be what Kleiner Perkins does. But uh, what I, what I learned, what was fascinating about NEA were all the physicians that were there. And I mean, Josh like knew things down to like the molecular level, Ali, like these were people who could have been in bench science doing, and they were, they were so intelligent. I was kind of it actually made my mind hurt with how much they knew. So I would literally sit at meetings and it was just, I, I, they would rattle off these phrases and I would Google like, what is an MD, you know, what is IRR? Uh, you know, I, I was like, what is this EBIT, EBITDA? EBITDA? Who is EBITDA and why do they keep talking about it? So I had a pretty steep learning curve. I bought books on Amazon, you know, EBITDA for dummies, term sheets for dummies. And I had great, the, the thing about NEA is that the people, that this might, might, may sound trite, but you know, it's, it's incredible how generous kind of people are with teaching me about things I didn't know. So how long yeah. How did it take you to? Feel as if you were making a real contribution as opposed to just sitting on the sidelines. And, and have, you, have you gotten to that point yet? <laughs> I did get you asked what I did. I mean, what I did understand yeah. your NCAP, CMA, 510K, I understood like how CMS makes coverage decisions. I understood, you know, how to staff with structures and funds the FDA. I, I understood kind of the process making on the regular board side. And then um, because I had to do so much, because I did so much work with private payers, including helping design um, Arnie Milstein was critical when he was looking at the business for my house. Thinking about all the payments for one of the employers. So I did a lot of that kind of work and got very steeped in what I guess would be considered kind of the means of operations for some of these things. So I actually could help companies. When they were struggling to think about, you know, issues with the FDA advisory committees, thinking about challenges with, you know, in payers, regional payers, how they made decisions to cover lab tests, how we were able to get, you know, a drug to be preferred on formulary. What were the factors? I, I, I sat in rooms with some of our companies for talking about launch price of a drug. I used to think there was some incredible scientific method for launch price of a drug. Not really, you know, we would look at like, we would index to, you know, is there anything in this class? What do we get paid? ASP, AWP. But sometimes it came down to what do we think we should charge for this? You know, so I, I think I, I think, I mean, you know, you can ask Josh, he's kind of held captive, but I think I did, I definitely contributed with the skill set I had. And then it kind of matured on from there. And now I really try to help because I have learned about the inner workings of term sheets and, and especially on the health services, digital health and health technology side, thinking about how to start companies. Did you ever feel that your policy perspective put you at odds with what a typical vet investor group would like to do? I mean, this is a, a, a kind of a reductive absurdum argument, but one could say that something like the FDA is 
is basically a, a check on reckless innovation. We want to make certain that drugs and devices work. Or, or do you do you see a, a real kind of positive contribution of policy issues to where innovation goes? No, I did. I did. I mean, you know, it's funny. I always kind of say, I forget that you're not going to say Medicare, you know, reasonable and necessary. And I think that kind of guides, like, how you think about, um, you know, innovation and scale. I think the thing that's interesting about uh, kind of your comment, like policy in general, is I think a challenge in policy, equity has never really been, it's a very popular word now, but I think that we're all struggling both in a regulatory nature and also in an innovation strategy. How do we achieve equity? I mean, you you all have in this room, how many patents, how many amazing companies, are they all getting to the populations that you intended them to? And what are the barriers to that? Often there are multitudes of them, right? They're regulatory, they're literacy, they're cultural. What is the role of an innovator in kind of tackling those? And I think many of you would want, I think many people would want to do that, but we don't have, um, there's no curriculum for that. There's no, so yet, and there's no real way to kind of identify how to show the FDA, for example, that your threshold of evidence meets the needs for safety and efficacy, but this meets a really critical need in a population that has been ignored, underserved, um, taken advantage of, if you will, you know, in the case of dialysis, some of the other things that are pet peeves of mine. So no, I think that, I actually think there's a lot more that innovators and policymakers have in common. The language just sounds a little, it's EBITDA here and it's, you know, PMA there and, um, you know, OMB rulemaking here and clearance there, but it's actually kind of the same goals that they want to achieve. Nobody wants to squash innovation. They just want to make sure that it's just like investors. They want to make sure that resources are used accountably. You know, they want to make sure there's a financial accountability for it. And then they want to make sure it actually has outcomes, investors outcomes in the form of an IRR or kind of returns to limited partners for the government. It's taxpayers. Right. So, I mean, or beneficiaries. It's actually, it's not simple, but that's, it's, it's actually analogous. Innovation and investment are at long term horizons. Figure the last couple of years in med tech, yeah. the exit time to exit for companies is, has uh, it taken longer, it's taken more money. Policy issues and political disagreements and debates are notoriously short term. I mean, particularly when you, you see, you know, turnovers like one-term presidents. Does that, does that, to you mind, represent a, a, an issue, a challenge, a, a problem for bringing your policy chops to what you're doing at NEA? No, not at all. Because the, the, the politicians do what they do. And honestly, I mean, the joke in DC is like, politicians do what they do, but like we kind of get work done behind the scenes. And so there are many things that started in the Bush administration that we carried over through Obama, carried over through Trump, carried over now into Biden. And so there's a, there's kind of this legacy, you know, there's a lot of fanfare around coming in at the beginning of a new administration and undoing things. That was a lot more prevalent from Trump to Biden. But in general, we don't kind of just kill like policy initiatives we may think, okay, how can we take this concept of, um, you know, global payments and primary care, the direct primary care program, how can we actually add to it and put equity in it, which is what the Biden administration did. They took something, they took something that was a Trump administration idea and actually kind of augmented it to accomplish some of their goals. And you see that a lot. So, and then remember, there's career, the, the real engines of these places are career staff. I was never a career staff. I was always a political appointee. But the real people who do things and can also be barriers are the career staff in some ways, in many ways. And 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 they they the joke amongst the career staff is like, we'll be here when the new president comes in. We'll be here when the lights go off. We'll be here when the next person comes in. And that's true. Yeah, they my, really my do. Actually a lawyer, they refer to political appointees as Christmas help. Yeah, they do. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Stop in. laughs> Yeah. Right. That's right. It's, it's very true. Right. It's very true. It's very so, true. So <laughs> your policy perspective can certainly <laughs> inform innovation per se. What about market access issues and particularly f f getting new yeah. innovation to the market faster? Is it, once you get to the point where the innovation is is on track, is there are there policy implications? Um you know, to getting those technolo those technologies and those drugs to the marketplace faster? Or is that an area where you want to leave 
the marketplace to 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 handle them. And I guess the flip side to seeing the FDA as an obstacle, it's also a it can be an accelerant to getting products to market. Right. But I mean, market aspects kind of the commercialization of how we pay for things or who pays for things. I think it's all just part of, I don't know, it's kind of later in the policy. Well, you have to think about it early, but it's also part of the policy spectrum. I mean, we, you can have great, we had a diagnostic and um, one of the barriers for getting the diagnostic paid for, there was a code that was existing, but for private payers and Medicare administrators, there's this whole world. Medicare administrative contractors having to negotiate with the region. And it was funny, my biggest like kind of contribution was that I could find inside of this opaque organization called the MAC, kind of who was the decision maker. And, you know, that was like life or death to one of our companies. And so there's, it's, it's, it's not always just the big things. It's kind of the small things, but that certainly does affect market access. And it's interesting if you look at um, the retinoblastoma, uh, I've got, I'm, Blanking on, based out of Philly, had a great return. Charismatic CEO, he's gone on to find. Anyway, it's brilliant how some of the very expensive drugs, how when you have a company that has benefited from an FDA approval, all the regulatory kind of kind of issues, but needs to right, but needs to get paid for, and it's expensive, and it's hard to get people's heads around it. Coming forward with kind of like a shared, you know, having some sort of novel kind of payment concept and then getting CMS to adopt it or getting a private payer to pilot it. I mean, that's, that's, that's all part of it. That's the market access. Well, very recently, um, there has been a lot of talk that one of the domestic issues my administration wants to push is um, having Medicare negotiate yeah. price discounts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, which uh, when I first found this industry, there was a senator from uh, Arkansas, Richard, uh, no, it was um, David Pryor who was trying to foster. That. Do you see that as a legitimate policy goal? I mean, that, or is that a marketplace issue? We Medicare drug price, price drug price negotiation or indexing yeah. to Medicare prices. Yeah. I, it's it's certainly a legitimate policy solution. The question, and this is where there's just this incredible debate. There's been papers published on it. Is you know, will this kill U.S. innovation? And now having kind of worked on the NEA side and seen how hard it is, just going back to my earlier comment, I had no idea how hard it is to start the companies, to have the capital and financing, knowing that how many of these companies absolutely will fail, how many of these investments will fail. I, I think it's incredibly insane to then say that Medicare kind of indexing drugs to Medicare cost or looking at the kind of 20 most expensive drugs that, and using that as the benchmark or saying that you know there's exclusivity around um, certain drugs, I think that's a very perverse way of controlling what we now know, which is that we subsidize a lot of the global cost as well. And that's a, I, I think there's some things that we have to accept in the United States that we do, and this is what we do. For example, employer-sponsored health insurance. Why is it that your health insurance is pegged to your job? I mean that you know that came out of kind of World War II, and there's a history behind it. We've kept it going for a lot of reasons. Is it the right policy? Probably not the best policy. But do you think so. that it is an appropriate role from a policy perspective for the government to be in the business, in the business of negotiating prices? Or once a product gets to the market, that's yeah. a market access issue and capitalism should flow and, and you know, we, we should so leave policy on it. I mean, I think, I think the answer is very obvious to me. Yeah. Government should not be, you know, kind of this is not the government's best set of skills or you know aptitude but it's also clearly like let the market just pay for what the market wants to pay is not going to work either and part of it is it is it i don't think most of the public understands kind of the role of like pharmacy benefit managers i mean there's it's not like the drug comes out of the manufacturing line and the molecule and then there's a cost and then it goes into patients pockets there's an incredibly complex chain that i would say is largely inefficient super cost ineffective that probably could be a better target. It was the one thing that the Trump administration that I, I was very sad that they let die was kind of their pharmacy benefit manager, the PBM rule. I actually thought like, go for all gusto on that because nobody wants that. So that's one example that's not government negotiation or let the market do what the market wants, but it could be part of the solution. It wouldn't be the only solution. I do think that kind of me too drugs, I, I have seen now and understand that 
something really different when you have a novel drug, a PARP inhibitor that um, NEA had an investment in for ovarian cancer. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you want to have thrive. And so I do think there's been some role in government with, you know, something from at least a, a small molecule that does not have that much of a difference from another. And I do think that, that there's an appropriate role for regulation in that circumstance. I'm going to get the name of the drug. It's a highly controversial drug now, which the CMS has just approved some limited payment for. Um, yes. Do you need to, that I remember that came out of Stanford that talks about kind of the issues with that. Um, that was wrong. The FDA made a bad call on that one. I mean, made a bad call. They, they did. That was, that was. They should not have approved because there was all that proving in there. You know, it, it's, a, a, well, that kind of um, the, the, the basis for the drug and kind of the like claim. But here's again a problem. We're watching this with Alzheimer's, with ALS. You've got populations that have nothing, nothing. Right. And they're willing to try anything. But you have to ask the question, like, is this, is this the best, going back to resources stewardship, you know, is this the best use of resources? Also, it's interesting from a policy standpoint, just for political baseball, um, usually like the FDA doesn't come out with something and then CMS does an immediate like smackdown. Usually, like the FDA commissioner and the CMS administrator sit down, well, they make nice. So they Did it? They haven't. This for a long time, the no. Internal discussions. No. Seen. No, they did not. So, so. we're right. We're going to be wrapping this time, and I want to leave time for Q and A. You are to this group, perhaps best known for guiding this country through. Our, our understanding of one being of COVID. Where do you think we are in COVID? What do you think yeah, the long term implications are? Are we should we all be masked here? We've uh, I don't have any symptoms. I test myself. I feel like every hour. Um, but you know, we are seeing in the East Coast. We're seeing numbers rising. New York. It's all kind of following a typical pattern. You all have had a very it, relatively speaking, you've had your surges, but the magnitude has been certainly a little, it, it's been less, not not small, but less. So I, I do think we've turned a corner because about 60% of the country has had an Omicron or kind of had didn't know they had Omicron and had Omicron. And so we've got a pretty large sector of the population that's already had some immunity by either vaccine or natural, you know, kind of infection induced immunity. That gives you a pretty decent wall, but it's not impenetrable. And when you look at the kind of uneven rollout of boosters, but you have to have a booster to have efficacy against original Omicron, BA2. I mean, there's we're definitely going into kind of an unknown territory. We don't follow global patterns the way we used to because of our timing. So this, this for some parts of the country and some populations could be bad. But I, I don't think we're going to see the kind of overwhelming saturation of our hospitals. The fall is where I worry. Right. The fall is what concerns me. You've been out of the administration uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. And I guess there are two views. There are some people who think that the Biden administration has simply not gotten a handle on the virus. And there are some people who say it's done about as good a job as it could get in the face of recurrent strains. Sure opposition at, at a kind of grassroots level to right. comment. Where, where do you come down on that debate? So I, I, look, I, and obviously my politics are clear. I mean, I like to say, look at my factual. What are the ones that's doing this? That weren't Biden doing this in the White House. So I'm, I absolutely think our country is in a better place. Are there things he could have done better? A hundred percent. No question. Um, what are some examples of that? I mean, we should not have had, we, we deferred so much to the science that we ended up having this bizarrely kind of uninterpretable, I mean, nobody understands what like Rochelle Walensky is showing, Fauci showing like antibody titers on like a PowerPoint, like nobody knows, like nobody knows what that is. And so we went so far that like all of a sudden the public is like, I don't understand, nobody understands. And then kind of lies and misinformation kind of seep in start hearing about the reports of cases of people dying after vaccines and myocarditis and these things proliferate. So could they have done something and gotten really kind of, you know, put Jen Psaki, who I have talking about anything, have her explaining COVID, that would probably be a better service, to be honest. 
So I think that there's things we could have done on a communication standpoint. And then we really should have been aggressive on boosters. We Nursing homes were ground zero for death. We did not get boosters. And I mean, it's just unexcused, you know, just like inexcusable kind of how we've sat on some of these things. And, and then now we're looking at, um, you know, operation warp speeds, gotten a lot of attention, good things, I would say overall public private partnerships, but somehow that's just been like vaccines only. We haven't really extended that to like therapeutics or what we can do in other disease areas, antibiotics, other, you know, so why are we not taking some of these approaches and kind of thinking about how to do that? I think um, ARPA age, some of the initiatives the Biden administration wants to do, uh, are kind of get at that, but they were too sheepish about it. And their time window is like kind of dwindling and narrowing because we're looking at the Congress flipping 20. I mean, we're at midterms pretty much. Do you have any perspective on whether, how, how quickly we will come out of COVID? I mean, there is a, there is a feeling that we will live with this for the rest of our lives and we'll yeah. just be taking sensible precautions or not. And there's also that, you know, look at the Spanish flu of 1917, 18. It was over in a couple of years. Right. I do tend to say some that people who are much smarter at looking at kind of the genetic patterns and how much, how many mutations have happened. Someone named Trevor Bedford is a must follow on Twitter. And he gave a great talk yesterday to the FDA where he basically said the pace of mutations of the spike protein of Omicron is at such it's five times higher than what they see in seasonal flu. So this is a smart virus and it figures out how to stay alive. So I'm prepared for it to be here forever and that we take precautions and the fabric of our lives have changed somewhat, but don't get disrupted and brought to a halt in many cases. But that means that we'll have an acceptable level of deaths and an acceptable level of morbidity. And, and we have to kind of deal with that. So you now at NEA really focus on the innovation Side, or should they, NEA is side. Do you think COVID will have long-term impacts on the kinds of products, both medical devices and drugs that come forward? I mean, I know some small medical device companies that uh, in, in, in 2020, we're talking about COVID related opportunities, but not till 2024, as they right. dealt with long-term COVID. Yeah, sure. No, I, I mean, remote monitoring, and there's been so much of a tailwind back it's and that's good so remote monitoring telemedicine um again some we, the fda has learned a little bit more about some of the acceleration that they should do and i think they will hopefully do some of that in the next kind of legislative package for the fda that you can keep permanent uh but i but i think there are some things that are gonna you know we don't, probably don't need all these um ways for at-home tests, or there's probably going to be some consolidation, as there naturally will be in some of those markets, but but there will still be a proliferation simply because of things that we just will not undo because they're the right things to do. If, if we can, when we can, put COVID behind us, you deal, you know, adequate coping strategies, and it just winds away. What do you think the major policy issues will be that we'll be facing, that maybe the the you know, late 2020s we'll be, be dealing with? Oh, we're still, I mean, so I kind of really feel like domestic policy, all, you know, health and all policies, education. I mean, so we can talk about all the things that are not kind of classic healthcare, and I think those have a huge impact, and we still have a lot of catching up to do. We have done nothing really in the space of behavioral and mental health. There's a lot of incredible startups and innovation. I'm not so sure, getting back to the disparities, the haves and the have-nots of an innovation, I don't think we've done enough there. Maternal health. I mean, there's some really kind of hard, nitty, there are no, there are no easy answers, and it needs a lot of solutions. Um, Medicaid. I mean, I, there's just a lot to do. People have been doing it in the administration. It's not like those things have just kind of died. It's just that those are going to come a little bit more to the forefront. We're going to open this up to questions in just a couple of minutes. Let me ask two before you go. We are in a very divisive political community right now, but you mentioned before about you know, the kind of worker bees who work behind the scenes and aren't, are you, do you look at today's political climate as therefore not having much of an impact on these long-term issues? Or do you think that the, the political, certainly seems like the political climate is more adversarial today than right. it, no, no, it's no, been it in a long time. It definitely has an impact, but the impact is in the form of budgets being stalled. I mean, it's the top level stuff, you know, you can't get, you know, it's so hard to, you know, it's so hard to confirm recommendations their Supreme Court justices, that has a spillover effect into budgets. They cannot get $10 billion for COVID 
to actually pay for things because they want to get something called Title 42. They want, they want uh, the Biden administration to put back in restrictions on immigration for public health measures. So, you know, that kind of thing, very partisan, a huge effect. And the way it's having an effect on kind of career staff is they're burnt out. I mean, they don't like dealing with this stuff either. And there's a demoralization that has happened over the years. And it's certainly continuing. Let me ask one final question, and we will have questions from the audience. I don't know if we have a microphone, do we? So the microphone we do, it'll come forward in just a second. But we're here at Biodesign, and Biodesign is committed to starting a health innovation policy program. What do you think about this? And and how how might the research conducted by this group make an impact? Well, I think everything so you can have programs that don't have to have the work like policy fellowship on it. A huge policy impact because that's the work the faculty, the fellows are doing. You have incredible kind of people here. I think the idea, and talking to many of the folks in the room, is that in fact, Stanford has so much. I mean, I've learned so much in two days and it's kind of embarrassing that I didn't really, I've known Josh did this, but I never really quite understood. So having, I, I should have come as an undergrad. Right, exactly. So I, I, I think the key is having, how can we actually learn, how can, it's not just DC, policy Sacramento. I mean, how can policymakers learn? How can we speak similar? How can that language actually start to cross and actually intersect work towards each other? So I think it's incredibly, I, I can't think of a better kind of place and time. I'm hoping, I mean, medical technology has been a very important kind of nucleus. I think we've been talking about all these other, you know, digital health, life sciences, it's all related. So hopefully that extends because that's got policy implications. And those kinds of opportunities. I mean, in I our world, I mean, that's a little crazy. I, it's, 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 and I know, right. They do, especially your Sand Hill Road. Right, exactly. It's, uh, it's, I know, but, but, but it's, it's, it's kind of, it's everything. Like this is an important, huge community that takes big bets. And, you know, it's not like NIH intramural research is necessarily doing that. Although with COVID, you've seen some examples. So I do think this is a great time to learn. And, and many people in the government want to kind of harness some of this and try to do it. It's just not something that they do well or we do, that we understand. Well, you've been just uh, informative and, and delightful and frank and honest and and we really appreciate your coming and sharing your thoughts and stanford won't turn you into a flaming conservative we'll right. let you keep your liberal bona yeah. bona fides <laughs> um can we so can we just take a couple can we take a couple minutes for questions we have time for questions Hi. Um, so much innovation comes from healthcare and healthcare comes from startups. Have you ever felt the pull to found or join a startup? Yeah, my husband's startup is um, a family or a startup. I think it's the hardest thing. I've, I mean, and he kind of, you know, it's, he didn't want to take outside money. So because he wanted to be in control and PhD. And I think, I think it's funny because he said to me for so long, we've been told what to do. I want to actually, I want to do something. I want it to look. No, no, he cannot. Um, but he'll, but he's, he's, uh, he's got to like learn that and have his path. It's very, I, I think it's one of those, it's probably one of those roles that maybe one day will make sense. But man, that is one of the hard, I mean, that's what I appreciated at NEA. This is the hardest work. And when you then look at um, female founders, you look at, I mean, people of color, barriers are so intense. So for now, I want to be the person that like bugs Josh and says, there's this company and maybe you should talk to them. And so how can I do that? But no, there's definitely um, a siren song of like, well, here's this idea. Why can't I do this? But I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, is that a role you can use to play in any way? It's just to hear about stuff to kind of that maybe haven't made their way to the fore. And yeah, absolutely. So I think it's, it's maybe one day, but it's also not getting back to like what I learned and when I fail at things, I think if I did that and didn't really kind of, um, kind of honor what I do well, I'm, I would probably say I, I would be doing it and I would probably not as, be as happy as I could if I thought about it at the right time or in the right way. So, yeah. 
So uh, I've never been as fascinated by a policy fireside chat as I've been today. <laughs> um, so Biodesign does a lot of work globally as well. Uh, we do a lot of work here in the US, but we do a lot of work globally as well. Um, and uh, so I had a question about lessons that we might we might be able to learn from our experiences in the US. I know most of your work has been US policy, but are there things that we can learn from our successes or failures uh, in places like India, where we have been for 15 years and we are advising the government there? Right now, I've learned, um, from India, I learned a lot about like surface factories for quality and volume and trying to understand um, how we should try to actually specialize services in order to deliver the best care. So. Uh, and then there's this incredible program called Project Echo that started with, with um, a New Mexico-based hepatologist, but he actually really launched the program in India, where because of such shortage of specialists, especially in India, but now also in the United States, that could actually, because of uh, the drugs for hep C that are like landmarks, but that had to be administered or at least oversight by a hepatologist, and there aren't that many of them, and there were so many patients with hep C, learning how to kind of teach primary care physicians like me how to prescribe these drugs and monitor patients and start them so I didn't have to wait eight months to get into a hepatologist. So no, I think there's an incredible amount of learning bilateral, kind of bidirectional. And then it's interesting, I've had um, colleagues from Germany and other countries that want to kind of quote copy parts of the United States, in, in, including fee for service. And I've always said, that's crazy. Why would you want to do that? But they've said, like, there are some things that we want to incentivize and, and use fee for service for. So I think in payment and research, manufacturing, I've been fascinated. I don't know enough about it, but it's been fascinating watching different global standards around manufacturing, how to ensure adequacy and quality quality and quantity in manufacturing, but how can we do some of that in the United States? That came to the forefront with COVID, with vaccine manufacturing, right? How can we recreate what we have seen in other countries? We still don't have it. And there's a lot of probably um, logistical reasons for it, but that that shouldn't be a barrier. So the US and Western Europe share culturally so many you know, common characteristics. When you get to places like India, um, in other places, is it a different discussion, a different set of issues for healthcare providers, or or is there a commonality that? Yeah, everywhere. I mean, you can pay doctors differently. You can call it and dress it up, say GPs here, but at the end of the day, it's haves and have nots on you know resources, access. I mean, it's, it's some things are just basic and fundamental, different. Different appearance, but same problem. Is there another question? Sure. sure. Since you brought up Planet Perkins, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I did say like it's not the biggest venture fund in the world. So. Well, I'll mention that they uh, in 2006 they started the pandemic fund. Pretty small yeah. fund. You'd be familiar, yeah. And they predicted, you know, the need for PPE for diagnostics for scaling ICU care. Yeah, yeah, like. We knew, and that there was part of it was bioterrorism too, but like it was kind of known, but it was very hard to find an investable business for an unpredictable event. And that's what's kind of hard to, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess my question to you is now that you have the investor hat on, do you see any way to that venture can drive solutions for the future, unpredictable turns we're going to take with COVID and pandemics? That's a good question. Um, so I've kind of been thinking a lot about long COVID. I mean, it's I mentioned a lot of what I do clinically. I think of long COVID as kind of, it'll be like diabetes or we'll have this kind of chronic disease nature to it. There's been a, um, intense interest to the NIH recover over a billion dollars, but that's really to do surveillance and monitoring and understand what this looks like over time. But I think venture could be incredibly helpful, not just on the therapeutic side, but on the care kind of services side. If anybody here knows somebody with long COVID and the care is awful, you have to advocate for yourself. Doctors don't know how to diagnose it. We're questioning our diagnoses. We don't have anything to do to support people. And there's actually a lot of overlap with a lot of other diseases for which we struggle to give people acknowledged solutions. So I think there's an incredible opportunity there. And you know, can, can that translate to kind of an investable, backable business? Ab absolutely. But this is where the kind of how can we then have a creative, compelling way to you know have a market for it, get people to see it, pay for it, even do more research in it. Antibiotic resistance, that's something that a lot of people share kind of a commonality in. 
other areas of bio, biosecurity. If anything, this is just illustrated to us that we can't overinvest in kind of biosecurity. But how, what does that look like? And then testing has been interesting. You know, we have fallen so short because of our lack of an ability to kind of have like quick, nimble testing. Think of how long it took to get us to rapid antigen tests. That's a little sad. I mean, it's just so could could venture tackle something else for rapid diagnosis of CNS diseases. I mean, there's there's a lot of attractiveness to t- taking these concepts and, and carrying them forward. And I think that there is gonna be an appetite for it. I think the hardest part is again, like the risks you all take, you're gonna lose a lot in order to potentially have one that returns on that investment. And how do you make those decisions? Do you think COVID elevates diagnostics? To, uh, as over therapeutic, I mean, to a to level with level therapeutics? Is it, there's another question back here. Sorry, it's just I I don't know why, but no. I mean, we're still struggling with cancer diagnostics, yeah. and you would think that would be a pretty straight, clean, you know, conversation. But it's not. Thank thank you. Uh, we have a question from one of our online attendees. Oh, see, yeah, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, so yeah, we have a reminder. This is actually a um, right. virtual no, event, so there are <laughs> many many people piece. on the call. Yes. Uh, So do you think that SBIR grant funding could be outsourced to the VC community as an alternative to current NIH, NSF, in-house vetting of applications? (laughs) No. Um, (laughs) No, no. I think I spent, um, it's been a while since I've kind of done a refresh on SBIR, but um, I did take a look at that, like in the Obama administration, an incredible person that ran both the small business administration and people inside of NIH and NSF that really wanted SBIR to be more nimble to actually. So what I would say is it's not necessarily kind of quote outsourcing it or kind of putting it or housing it within VCs. It would actually be, could we do what we did with the US digital service? Could we take some VC talent? Could we bring them in house and kind of work in a rapid cycle fashion to fix some of the problems. And I actually think that's a better posture. Venture capital firms, you know, Kleiner Perkins, NEA, I mean, these things can change, shift priorities over time, but the government's there and the confidence or at least the appropriations and the funding for that could be kind of continued. So I would actually argue the opposite. And I think that's actually a great idea. Someone who's online can volunteer to do that, you know, kind of make that happen (laughs) it's a pay cut though so (laughs) next question we have from an online caller or attendee former president obama was just at the white house celebrating the anniversary of Mm -hmm. the aca Mm -hmm. and he um analogized the aca to the social security act and medicare in terms of programs that were founded on basic principles and then grew from there Given the opposition that still exists towards the ACA, do you see that remaining a long-term part of our nation's healthcare system? I do. I mean, as much as people look in 2010, um, the Republic, the minute it passed, the Republicans, Mitch McConnell had a press conference the next day, you know, repeal the ACA. And what have they come up with? I mean, there was repeal and replace, replace with what? And so there are as much as Republicans don't want to admit it. And by the way, I, I have talked with, uh, they will tell you that there are many good things to the ACA. And now that there has been this kind of the insurance marketplaces, the kind of flexible access, people will say like the subsidies for families, um, who wants to do away with some of, you know, who wants pre-existing conditions to come back? Uh, parents who were able to keep their kids on health insurance to the age of 26. I mean, preventive care, like going back and asking women to pay copays for mammograms or people, men and women to pay copays for like, you know, screening colonoscopies, like that's insane. And we should never have done that. We should even do more than that. So no, people can complain, bitch and moan. Yes, enrollment has increased. It got, it got truncated or like in the Trump administration, they took back a lot of the money and shortened the enrollment period. But no, we, they have added over time, 31, Kevin, can I can't remember, 31 to 50 million people to ranks of insurance. Pushing ACA, got a lot of heat for kind of misstating yeah, in the early that, rollout. Was that a, was that a mistake on his part, or was he forced into that by? Like the doctor you have, you can keep it, and they're like, no, you can't. <laughs> 
can't. Uh, no, you can't. Behavioral and mental health, and obviously, part of COVID and post COVID, there's a huge avalanche of crisis. Uh, are there policy changes you can think of that could make a difference in addressing those populations? China, other countries, we just don't have enough behavioral health specialists. We really don't. But you know, someone like me, I am very smart. I I'm wasting my time like seeing people with sore throats and doing that I don't need to do in a clinical office. So I'm getting replaced with advanced practitioners. Fine. You should probably retrain me and I can become an incredible like mental health specialist. But because we have, you know, GME, we have credentialing, we have boards, we have so much in the way that would discourage that. But has anybody tried to get an appointment with a psychiatrist, much as a child psychiatrist, a psychologist? It's, it's criminal. So we have children. There's a great New Yorker article on child suicide and the crisis yeah. in children. And it is, I couldn't finish it because I've had, I've, Josh knows this. I've now had 47 people, patients and friends I know that have died from COVID. I've had two friends who had their teenage children killed, died by suicide. I mean, like, you know, people want to say like, but the world is shitty right now. It's isolated. It's lonely. I mean, it's so incredibly grave. But what are we doing? We're squandering talent. And and in India or China, I mean, they would just be like, okay, there's this many people. We're just going to do it. We're going to figure it out. You know, we're going to, in Japan, I've traveled in Japan and seen the hospitals there where they bring the communities in and let families come to like kind of be part of the care solution. We need to do something. I mean, I'm hoping that the bio design, you know, I'm hoping that this grows to tackle these problems because the heart of it, the mission, it's all there, but we need solutions. This is where VCs can come in. This is where they are. They are, they are funding it, but we need to flip this and think, you know, a little kind of a little radical craziness is what we need right now. And people are willing to entertain it because there's nothing out there. And I fear the majority of patients I see now, I see women, they're losing their hair. They're, I mean, everybody's kind of like, the world is like on a nerve. It's like a, it's like a very open frayed nerve. And there, and we all, I feel like, you know, I, I tell my husband, I'm like, if I see a bad commercial, I start crying. Like we're all just kind of on the edge a little bit, but we're, you know, in America, we just kind of suck it up and we kind of get over it. But that, that takes its toll. It adds to the partisanship. It adds to the cynicism, you know, and, and so we do need to tackle that. And I do think there's a lot we could do. Well, this has been depressing. I know, super depressing. Super. That was really make everyone cry. That's. I, I've been told I shouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. To stop this. So, again, thank you so much for coming.